Thanks, Chair. Um, Minister, I think on the one hand, I, I very much welcome the fact that we're here again discussing the other, this issue. But on the other hand, I think it really reflects very poorly on this House that all we do is talk about it. And in actual fact, there has been no action whatsoever in any meaningful uh, sense on this issue. Now, I recognise over the course of the five or six debates that we've had uh, on this issue in the lifetime of this government that there has actually been a seismic shift in the attitudes of many of the representatives across the entire political spectrum. And I sincerely welcome that fact. It is a good step forward. But sadly, it's not good enough and it's not quick enough because there's a huge gulf between the reality on the ground and the sentiments and the actual policy on display here. Now, the last time we discussed this here, Minister, you said, as you've said today, that as a doctor you considered the uh, Eighth Amendment to be too restrictive. You explained the circumstances where it has no regards for the long-term health of a woman in conditions like stroke, heart attack and uh, so on. Of course, what you didn't say at that time was that you knew then that there was another initial being added to the list of women whose identities have been hidden as a result of the fact that they've been a tragic victim uh, of this Eighth Amendment in the case of uh, PP, uh, the woman who was clinically dead but being kept alive on life support because she was pregnant. And you talked during that debate about the Eighth Amendment exercising a chilling effect on doctors and that legal considerations were replacing what should be medical decisions. And you were absolutely right in that statement. But you then concluded that the government shouldn't rush this, that what we needed was a careful and considered debate in the spring, you know, we, rather than rushing into it in the spring. Well, I mean, here we are in the spring, and the government has made no provision whatsoever for any debate, not to mind a considered or a careful one. And, you know, not rushing something isn't the same as doing nothing. And that's in reality what you've done. I would actually put it that you've done in some ways worse than nothing because the Protection of Life During Pregnancy Act failed to do what it said it would do. It does not give pregnant suicidal women access to a legal abortion in Ireland as they're lawfully entitled. We know that that's the case because of the tragic instance of Miss Y. It continues to criminalise uh, abortion and it resulted in the UN committee last August stating that they had a severe concern about the restricted circumstances in which women have abortions due to Article 43.3 and the strict interpretation that existed in Ireland. They talked about criminalising in the activity, they talked about the lack of legal clarity, excess scrutiny for doctors and interference with the medical uh, profession, discrimination against those who can't afford to travel and our laws adding to the mental suffering of our female citizens. And they required us to revise our legislation, including our constitution, to take account of circumstances where uh, women require an abortion in circumstances of rape, incest, health and fatal fetal abnormalities. And, you know, that is a position which is roundly supported by the overwhelming majority in successive opinion polls. It's also the case that failure to do this would be in breach of Articles 2, 3, 6, 7, 17 and 19 of the European Convention on Human Rights. And yet we talk about rushing this issue. I mean, seriously, the point has been made. There's not a single person of present reproductive age who had a say in the original Eighth Amendment. The government has been four years in office and it's failed to address the issue. Now, I agree with the points that have been made, that this shouldn't be uh, a political football, that it shouldn't be an exercise in political point scoring. The reality is nobody across the political spectrum has equipped themselves very well on this topic. I think it is an incredible irony in the fact that Labour deputies, who when times were hard, went out and campaigned against the original uh, Eighth Amendment, getting vitriolic abuse at that time, when they're in power, fail to address the issue and then come in and say, well, you've got to wait for another Labour government if you have any hope of getting it. Seriously, it's an absolutely ludicrous position. I think 
all of the parties have moved on on this, and I welcome that. It's not a thing. This is the first time that the Socialist Party have tabled in this. It's in this stall. It's the first time that the Socialist Party have positively tabled an issue on abortion. That, I welcome that move, as I welcome the move in Sinn Féin and all of the other issues as well. I think everybody has moved on on this issue. But the problem is our lack of action and dealing with that has, has resulted in an enormous gulf on the ground. Now let's look at the Eighth Amendment and why it was brought in. Abortion was already illegal in 1983. It was brought in because the Catholic establishment wanted to be sure to be sure that there would never be abortion in Ireland. Well, I mean, it's abysmal failure should be reason enough for why it should now go, because the Eighth Amendment didn't stop Irish abortions. It just stopped them happening in Ireland. And we've exported 160,000 mothers, daughters, wives, sisters, girlfriends to have that procedure done in a different country. And to add insult to injury, our constitution actually gives us a legal right to an abortion, but it just says we have to have that outside of uh, our waters. And the only people then who can't have it are people who are too poor, too sick, or of um, precarious immigrant status. And I do think that the Eighth Amendment stands as a monument to our hypocrisy. That's all it is. It's an unbroken thread to the Magdalene Laundries, symphysiotomy symphism, and so on, because the truth is that the annual rate of abortion worldwide is roughly similar anywhere, everywhere. There's no link between whether abortion is legal or not uh, and the amount of women who end up having abortions. Um, the only thing that changes is their access to safe abortion with the result that probably during the course of this debate, worldwide, 12 women will have died as a result of unsafe abortions. Now, I've heard our lack of abortion provision being described as medieval. The reality is, in medieval times, we had the Black Death and high mortality rates, and they didn't give a toss whether women had abortions or not. And it's actually been um, established, if you like, by anthropologists that abortion has been actually a worldwide phenomenon as long as men and women have had sex. Women have attempted to deal with their pregnancies and while surgical abortions were rare until the end of the 19th century, evidence of, of pharmaceutically induced abortions uh, were commonplace in Egyptian, Babylonian times and so on and even in rural areas that were untouched by modern medicine. They've always been there. What changed was during the 19th century it became criminalised and that was part of a campaign against growing women's rights and autonomy. It was a backlash against suffering against uh, voluntary motherhood and the other struggle for uh, women's rights in that regard. So that's the context in which this restriction came, came. And the only way out of it is to have a system, which I obviously support, where we would have in this country free, safe, legal abortion as part of our health service for any woman who wants it, whatever that reason is, as part of our overall reproductive rights, which includes the right to have a child and the right to raise that child with uh, dignity and support. It is a fundamental human rights and health issue. And I suppose the question really is how do we get there? I think we would have been there already if we didn't have the safety valve of Britain to take, if you like, uh, all, all of the cases. I think our starting point has to be to accept that the Constitution is no place for decisions about women's bodies and women's health. It's completely inappropriate and we need to take it out in order to, after that, either regulate or legislate for abortion. Now, the Minister has said that that will remove the protection that the Constitution currently affords to women. I, I don't accept that argument because we'd only then be in the same position as men. In actual fact, what it would do is remove the conflict between the rights of women and the right of the unborn. And as you know, doctors have a duty to their patients anyway, so I don't think if this is removed that they're going to go a free-for-all of endangering women's uh, lives. It is the case that some citizens do not agree with abortion, and I fully accept uh, their right to make that decision uh, for themselves. I stand over it and campaign for them not to be uh, forced into abortions, but equally the point is that that has to be uh, a choice for a woman herself. She shouldn't have to justify or explain her decisions and we shouldn't have to be second-class citizens. The last point, uh, Ciarán Corla, is I think we have to register that, you know, what we do here matters and has consequences. And what we don't do here matters 
and has consequences. The Minister last time round referred to the Attorney General in the original amendment arguing and advising the government against bringing it in because of the mess that he would create. And that Attorney General was right. But you, Minister, voted and hid behind the present Attorney General in not dealing with legislation in relation to fatal fetal abnormalities, a decision which, between that vote a number of weeks ago and now, has resulted in a number of our citizens having to be banished from these shores to have that procedure away from their families and uh, support. Life isn't black and white. It's very complex. The idea that you could have something in our laws that dictate what somebody can do with their body and their health is, is to me, absolutely uh, reprehensible. We should be, as a state, supporting people uh, in their decisions uh, and not adding to the uh, trauma and, and difficulties that sometimes arise in life.